motorsport performance um, vehicle dynamics okay so um, it's just going to go through uh, some basic, the basics just to remind you okay so um, we started off looking at steady state steering and we reviewed the different types because you covered that last year in uh, automotive technology um, looking at the at low speed where um, the tyres are not generating um, uh, enough lateral force that, you know, for the slip angles to be involved. Um, so lateral acceleration is negligible. The steer angle is uh, just the Ackerman angle. Okay. Um, so the centre of the turn is, is perpendicular to the vehicle direction okay. um, and in line with the, uh, with the rear axle. Okay. Um, and the, yeah, the steer angle is simply just the Ackerman angle, uh, assuming small angles. Um, but the high speed um, cornering, um, you can't neglect lateral acceleration. And so the tyres generate their cornering force via slip angles. And the slip angle is defined as the difference between the vehicle's, the tyres' direction and the tyres' uh, direction of travel. So where it's pointing and where, it actually, where it's actually moving. And that's the slip angle. And the slip angle is the thing that generates a, the cornering force that provides, obviously, the cornering of the vehicle. Um, and uh, so the steer angle that you need to, to um, maintain a, a, a radius at a certain speed, um, not only have you got the Ackerman angle, L upon R in there, but you also need to include the front steer angle, the uh, slip angle and the rear slip angle. Uh, okay. And uh, depending on um, the ratio between those two slip angles, it gives you the different cornering um, behaviours. So if they're equal to each other, then you have neutral steer because they cancel each other out and your steer angle is simply your Ackerman angle. Um, if the vehicle understeers, that means the front slip angle is greater than the rear slip angle, and so an increase in speed will require more steer angle to be applied, okay, to maintain the core, corner. And oversteer is where the rear slip angle is greater than the front slip angle, and an increase in speed, so increase in lateral acceleration, you actually need to reduce the steering to maintain the corner, okay. Um, the don't forget units is that, you know, um, bear in mind that often alpha F and alpha R when you found the from a graph or something will actually be in degrees. L upon R, um, if you just enter that in metres, then you end up with a, with a, a radiance. And so you need to make sure that you're comparing apples with apples when you're doing the um, equation. And to find alpha F and alpha R, often you'll, it's involved, it uh, involves finding the load, vertical load, and the lateral load, okay? And once you've got those two things, you can then, uh, you can then, um, uh, Hi. I was just, is this just a revision? Yeah. Quick revision session? Yeah. I think me and my friends are going to continue with dissertations of that. Okay. I just wanted to see is it like anything being recorded or is it just. I'm recording it, but it's, um, it's um, uh, since, since it's just. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, turned, I didn't oh. thought it was. May as well do it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sorry, we didn't show up. That's all right. Cheers. Who else is not coming then? Uh, it's just me, Kieran, and Willa that I know of. We're just sat in one of the upstairs rooms. Just as long as you're, as long as you're happy, then you let me. But yeah, I'll, I'll record it. I'll stick up. On my own. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah. So if you um if you if you've got this equation um to find the steer the steer angle, okay, um then you need to find L upon R will probably be given in the question. Will base and radius, corner radius, uh, but you need to find the the, the front and rear slip angles. Then, um, from the tyre data, um, you'll need to find uh, the vertical load and the lateral load that's being generated. And then from that, you can pick off um, what the slip angles will be, which is what these are, um, you know, which are what the different lines represent. And so, you know, say you had a, I don't know, um, say um, two and a half um, vertical load, and say one and a half um, kilonewtons lateral load. So you're up here somewhere. And so you can see you're just under four degrees of slip angle, so I don't know, three point six or something like that. Um, yeah, no, under under that line. Um, yeah, so that's basically how you need the need the tire data. But you need to calculate these things, and those can be calculated from various bits of information about the vehicle um, in terms of uh, front rear mass distribution and the corner radius and the vehicle speed and those sorts of things. You can work out what those values are. <clears throat> okay, so that was chapter two. It's quite a lot of revision, although um, it's revision of, of content that was taught in 
in level two, but uh, but but in level two we assumed linear tires, probably. Whereas obviously now you've got a non-linear tire data that you're actually using. So chapter three um, was about springs and dampers, okay, um, and talked firstly about um, stiffness of springs um, and the fact that sort of in, in motorcycle applications you tend to have harder springs in road cars, and that's uh, basically because in in racing cars um, you've got much increased load. Um, and much higher g-forces uh, and um, often um, in racing applications you've got aerodynamics involved and they require a stable platform that doesn't move around a lot for, for their effectiveness um, but allied with that to get traction you should have quite a relatively soft um, uh, setup because um, that will give you a better better traction um, so then you've got to have this compromise. And often what happens is you have a front end, the, you know, the non-driven axle being quite stiff, the rear axle, which is, which is, a, is will be the driven axle, will tend to have a sort of slightly softer set. Um, so there's a compromise that is, needs to be met. There's a bunch of different spring types, okay? Um, coil springs, um, they're the most common. Um, uh, because they're so common, they're quite cheap, um, and they're quite compact in terms of uh, space, but you've got to have, they, they don't do anything in terms of locating the axle, so you've got to have a lot of linkages or different suspension types um, that will do the location, and the coil, the spring will just be this, this coil, okay? Um, leaf springs, uh, they're also very cheap because they're very stri straightforward, just a, a strip of, uh, uh, of metal, um, or composite, depending on, um, but they can be used to locate because there's a bit of um, stiffness in, um, in the lateral direction as well. Um, horizontally stiff, and it, sometimes you, know, you can have lots of layers and that will give you a progressive rate so the more load, the stiffer the spring will become. Um, but like that can induce noise. Um, and if you've got multi-layers, you need to make sure that they can slide without friction um, uh, with respect to each other. So there's a maintenance requirement. And uh, in terms of deflection, they're not so great um, you know, to get um, big deflection of axles and stuff you want on uh, uh, coil springs. Um, torsion bars, um, they're, they're, they're um, you know, that's, that's where you, you're twisting a piece of um, uh, material to provide some stiffness. Uh, low maintenance, like the coil springs, um, you can adjust for height very straightforwardly just by changing the way that that bar is uh, um, clamped. Um, depending on the construction of the bar, it can be quite long, it can be quite short. Um, so it obviously depends on how you how you're going to set up and what sort of movement you want. Um, but often, you know, springs uh, in you know, lots of uh, applications where you don't have the space for a cord or something, you'll you'll um, actually have a torsion bar. Um, I think most uh, modern F1 cars will use torsion bars as their coils, as their, as their spring elements. Um, so another type of spring would be gas, okay, so uh, like air um, or hydro pneumatic, uh, and they provide, um, they're, they're basically designed around sort of luxury and good, because they give very good comfort, good um, uh, primary and uh, high frequency and low frequency uh, uh, inputs um, well dealt with, okay. Um, clearly it's very easy to adjust the right height, you just add more air or in hydro pneumatic case more oil. And you can incorporate the damper um, element in the hydro pneumatic setup because you've got this oil and and, uh, and uh, gas medium, uh, and you can set up, set, set up the system such that the oil uh, bit can do the damping as well. Um, but like a coil spring, you can't locate the axle, so you need you need um, uh, um, additional linkages, and also um, there's a maintenance requirement because these uh, components that are being used don't tend to last forever, okay? Um, and then the, the other sort of type of spring that's in part of the suspension system, but doesn't deal with the main sort of inputs, are these uh, bump stops uh, at the end of the travel. So at the bottom or the top of the travel of the suspension, you've got an additional sp uh, sort of a compliant element, often rubber or something, and that basically will slow down the motion um, as it reaches the end of its travel. So you don't end up with a, with um, metal coming into contact with metal when the physical limits are reached. So you you end up you've got this spring that you're compressing, so that you know that more and more um, resistive force. Um, but then then obviously when you get to the end of the travel, you need to 
stop it from moving any further. And so you've got this gradual transition between spring rate to a, to a much more solid um, rubber uh, stopping point. Um, but it obviously will, will then stop um, the vehicle moving and stop you damaging um, the suspension. Boys, <coughs> seeing vans and that, leafs, mm -hmm. more popular in the rear. Why are they popular in the rear? Because it's very strong. Well, if you've got a rear-wheel drive vehicle with a solid rear axle, which often lots of commercial vehicles have, it's a very straightforward of way of, of just mounting the... But are they stiffer because you can add multiple layers? Well, you can add multiple Juicy layers, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, obviously, with the load um, in a van being quite variable, obviously it's unloaded or loaded up, then obviously, you, yeah, um, uh, you can add more layers. Um, and the more layers you... Uh, as you add layers, what you get is a, like a rising rate progressive spring. So the more it compresses, the stuff it becomes. Um, whereas, whereas spring rates are normally quite linear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so, um, whereas, yeah, when we, um, with the vans you can sell that. But like I said, it's also very cheap. Yeah. Um, so that's why commercial vehicles and vans and pickup trucks and that sort of stuff tend to have quite a, a rudimentary rear axle. Um, often it's a solid rear axle. Yeah. And even front-wheel drive vans, um, if you look under the back of the, like a front-wheel drive Transit or Renault, traffic or whatever the you know the different types of front wheel drive vans they'll still have a solid rear axle yeah. as a beam but it won't obviously it's not driven at all it's just there yeah. um so in terms of modeling um uh, a vehicle you can you can do what's known as the quarter car model so that's where you take the plan view of the car and you cut it into half and half again you end up with a quarter the car, okay, and that could be schematically shown uh, with this sort of diagram where you've got the, uh, the sprung mass, which is obviously the vehicle body, um, you then have the unsprung mass, which is the wheel, the wheel up, brakes and that sort of stuff, okay, and, and part of the suspension system, and then obviously the road, and these all have different displacements, so ZS being the motion of the sprung mass, ZG being the motion of the unsprung mass, and obviously ZG being the, uh, the profile of the ground, okay, and between the sprung and unsprung mass you've got the suspension spring, and the suspension damper, okay? Between the unsprung mass and the ground, you've got the stiffness of the, of the tire. Um, there, is a, there is a CT term, a, a damping of the tire, but it's very, very low, and it's you know, negligible compared to the damping from the, from the suspension spring, so we often neglect it, just to count that as a, as a, as a simple thing. And the tire stiffness is gonna be much, much stiffer than the suspension stiffness as well. Um, although there will, there will be compliance, and it is important. Um, and in lots of like uh, racing applications and stuff, one of the things that changed this year with Formula One was moving to, from 13-inch wheels to 18-inch wheels, and and there's a corresponding drop in the um, uh, in the tyre sidewall, and obviously uh, in the past that was quite a big significant impact because the the, the depth of the sidewall used to provide quite a lot of the suspension motion, and this year obviously that's now massively increased as much, uh, you know, because it's less sizable, it's much stiffer, and so they need to incorporate more of that uh, motion into the spring Does the air in the tyre affect the stiffness? The pressure mm. in the tyre will affect the stiffness. Yeah. Why have you changed the air? So if you put hydrogen in it? Oh, or nitrogen or something. Nitrogen. Um, I think that's probably less, or less of an impact, but it's, fact it's, more, it's more about the pressure. There's a couple of different frequencies um, that are important. There's one, one, the first one is called body bounce. You know, this is a two degree freedom setup, so there's going to be two mode shapes and two natural frequencies. Um, the first one uh, is body bounce, so that's basically you assume very little mass and, and you compare to MS and you end up with the body uh, oscillating around. Um, you know, if you neglect MU, you can actually work out what the stiffness and damping of that, of that setup will be, um, and you end up with this body bounce frequency. And so if the ground is oscillating at that body bounce frequency, then that's going to excite the, 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 the sprung mass, OK? The other frequency is called wheel hop, and that's where basically, because MS is so much bigger than MU, you assume that's stationary, and then you get the input. You've got a MU oscillating between the two, um, you know, in, with those springs in parallel. It's a much higher frequency, um, body, uh, wheel hop. And then obviously, again, if you um, um, excite the ground at the wheel hop frequency, you M MU, going up and down, but MS won't actually be moving that much. Um, so, yeah. so when they change, because in Formula 1 they use different compounds, don't they? They use different Soft, medium, hard. 
Yeah, that's to do with the, with the actual material being used in the tyres. Yeah, so that would affect that as well. Uh, that's no, that's probably that's less around. Um, the, that, that's more about the, the interaction between the tyre and the ground. Yeah, but if you're using a different material, yeah, the properties of stiffness is going to be different. Potentially, yeah. yeah. It depends. It's partly. I know it might be really small, but yeah, yeah. But the but no, that I mean that that material difference that um, is around the interaction between the ground yeah. and, the, and the tire. Um, the actual stiffness of the tire, um, like I said, it's more around um, the construction of the tire, the size of the tire, and also yeah, and as we said, the pressure inside the tire. As in terms of what gas they use inside the tire, I don't think that makes that much of a difference. Um, Which make it lighter or heavier? Or not. Yeah, not by a lot. Not by a lot. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah. Um, um, I guess it changes the heat. Transfer. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they're those sort of thermal elements, um, and I, I think, you know, some high performance, you know, high performance applications have used like nitrogen to fill the tank with nitrogen, so, you know, gas and or yeah, really air is yeah. Um, so yeah, so those, they, that, if you take that model, that schematic, and you want to work out what those frequencies are, then those equations, you can see this is clearly. A natural frequency, which is just the mass. The square root of that will give you a frequency. <coughs> Divide by two pi, that will give you in terms of hertz. And so this is obviously that that spring stiffness there is the is springs in series, and you can see that stiffness is springs in parallel. Okay, and it's just a simple um, root care problem, and then divide by two pi to get it in hertz. And so those are the two natural frequencies for that for that setup basically. Sorry, making some uh, some some you know. Uh, yeah, making some assumptions around the relative masses. Are you need to row the same way yeah. you would to um, us in vibration dynamics? No, because we're making assumptions okay. around around them. But you can, I mean, you can do it. They'll be close. Yeah. But yeah, it's not the same way. Do you need to know those assumptions? Well, they're, they're in the notes. Okay. It's open book, so... so. Um... The other thing that's important when looking at springs is the fact that the spring, the actual spring element, will not necessarily be in line with the wheel. Okay, and so there's going to be a, a ratio in terms of the stiffness of the wheel and the stiffness of the spring. Okay, and that's what that lever ratio is there. Um, that should actually be a squared term, lambda squared, upon on the bottom of those. So obviously the wheel rate and the spring rate are going to be different, um, and that lever ratio that. Lambda term um, will be the ratio between the two. Like so there will be a, like root on top of the lambda. Yeah. No, that should be a, that should be a squared. So. Oh, squared. Yeah. So, if I, so that should be two. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's basically the, that, how that works. And that, like I that's also derived in the um, in the uh, um, in the notes. Okay, um, yes, let's keep going. Let's turn it off. Okay, right, so anti roll bar, um, additional springing element generally between the, between the uh, sides, um, and will uh, impact the roll stiffness, okay. And if you add an anti-roll bar, it means you can have, have a high roll stiffness, but you don't necessarily need to increase the springs. Because obviously, you know, one of the ways to add a stiffness is to increase the roll is increase the, the, the stiffness of the springs each side. But if you have an anti-roll bar, you can maintain relatively soft springs, uh, get it on in the vertical direction, but you've got high roll stiffness. Okay, and obviously, um, roll um, can often lead to adverse camber, and if you can stop the vehicle from rolling, then you stop that adverse camber um, coming into account. Um, and it's tuned to affect handling, okay? And so, uh, in terms of understeer and oversteer, which we talked about in the previous chapter, um, often high performance front wheel drive cars will have a quite stiff rear end, okay, with a stiff roll bar, um, and that will give you to decreased understeer because a front wheel drive car will have a tendency to understeer. Um, uh, whereas a rear-wheel drive car, which would normally would naturally lead to a more oversteery type car, will have a stiff front end, and that decreases oversteer. Um, um, uh, but it has no effect in heat. So in terms of if, if a vehicle is being compressed completely by downforce or whatever, a roll bar will have no impact because it's not being twisted. 
Okay. Conversely, a heave spring, which is the other, the other sort of um, bar that connects the two sides together, um, will be again um, won't have any effect in roll. But if if you compress both sides of the suspension by the same amount, then the heave spring will twist, and you end up with a with a situation where uh, basically a, 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 a stiffness in terms of heave. And like I said, that's really useful if you've got a vehicle with a lot of downforce and you want to deflect that um, that force, um, uh, yeah, from stopping that force from compression the suspension, you can em- employ a heave spring and that will try and maintain some stiffness and heave. But again, it, ge- it means you've got independent control of the vertical motions um, uh, and in terms of roll, it doesn't, it doesn't have any impact. Uh, if one goes up and one goes down, there's no, that, that heave spring's not being twisted at all. Um, yeah. Okay, the, the other element um, in suspension systems, you've got springs, the other part is dampers, okay, they're also called shock, shock absorbers, and basically they're there to um, damp out oscillations of the input. If there's no damping, then you provide an input to the spring system and it's going to oscillate um, much further, whereas dampers will, uh, will aim to absorb some of that energy, okay, dissipate it as heat. And often the way they're constructed will be a um, there'll be a hydraulic uh, cylinder with a rod and a piston, and in the piston there'll be some orifices. And so as the damp moves, that oil within the within the hydraulic um, cylinder will have to pass through those orifices. And depending on the size of those orifices, you've obviously got some losses going on there, and uh, and it absorbs energy out of that system. Um, but, and depending on the, the way the orifices are set up, you can have different rates. For extension and decompression, um, uh, and there's different. You can also you know, have solenoids to change the valving, which gives you sort of uh, active damping, um, so adapt or adaptive damping. And you can also change the fluid within there, um, uh, you know, to have this uh, magneto or electrological type setup where you change the um, the uh, the uh, uh, magnetic field, electrical field around the fluid will change its viscosity, which will change how much. Um, it um, restricts the motion, how much it will resist the motion. Um, so that's a typical sort of damper profile there. We've got um, uh, movement in the uh, in the um, velocity, it's viscous damping, so it's based upon velocity. Um, so that's all on the x-axis and the forces in the y-axis. Okay, um, and then the last section is what's called active suspension. Um, so that's where Basically, you're trying to address this compromise that you have to strike between handling and uh, comfort, okay? Um, uh, handling and ride. Um, and basically, the idea would be to Im- introduce a, um, an active element into that suspension system, okay? And there are various different levels, like I said, semi-active, where you can have, you know, you're just adjusting the roll bar stiff, let's say, or um, you've you're, uh, got active damping, or you actually you know, go through the whole process of replacing um, springs and dampening elements with um, active elements, or or having them in, in series with them. Okay, um, and, uh, you know, like I said, there can be downsides in terms of cost and complexity, and obviously power consumption is one of the issues. But the other the other thing is that is sort of understanding what the vehicle is going to be doing. So there's various setups, you know, in, where it sort of scans the road ahead and looks at what's coming up. And then can adjust the suspension as the vehicle passes over those sorts of things. And, you know, so there's lots of you know, development going on in this sort of area trying to try and maintain comfort, um, but yet still give good um, handling. Okay, so that's chapter three. Chapter four was around um, types and parameters. So we looked at the you know, springs and damping elements, but now how are they arranged in the vehicle? So it's more sort of kinematics. Um, there's fundamentally two different types of suspension. There'll be the rigid types and semi-rigid and, and, and independent. Okay, rigid and semi-rigid are basically the two sides that are connected to each other. Okay, uh, and the independent means that they're, they're independent of each other. Okay, um, and there's a bunch of different independent types that we talked about: trailing arm, semi-trailing arm, double wishbone, strut, and multi-link. Okay, um, and uh, and the, uh, you know, in the notes, you can look at what the advantages and disadvantages of each of those system, systems are and why they're used in certain applications and not in others, okay? But double wishbone is, is a clear 
um, importance because that's the one that's most fundamental in motorbike applications um, due to its uh, ability to be, you know, um, adjust and tuned and fine tuned uh, for what you need, and it's quite lightweight in those sorts of things. Um, but then it's not so suitable for general road cars, um, certainly smaller ones, because of the amount of space um, that's used up in the, in the in the in terms of the width. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and then in terms of tuning, there's a bunch of parameters that are down to the vehicle design. So, central gravity position, wheelbase, and track width. They're generally set at the design stage of the vehicle. Um, you know, depending on the class of the vehicle that you're building. Um, and the central gravity position will be positioned, you know, optimised as to where it needs to be. But then there's a bunch of parameters that can then be adjusted um, down the road in terms of the things like tow, camber, caster, and steering axis and kingpin geometry. And those are the sort of things you might be able to, you know, if in terms of adjusting, there's things that you would probably do at the design stage, and there are things that you could say do in the pits. So, those are the uh, aspects, tow, camber, caster, and steering axis, um, and camping geometry. Those are the sort of things you could adjust at a later stage, and they all have specific impacts on different uh, aspects of vehicle uh, of, of handling. And so, yeah, adjusting the tow and the camber will change the, the way that the vehicle feels and responds. Um, yeah, and so obviously there's an there's a element there of understanding what will change what. Okay, um, in fact, you know, yeah, we, so if you, you've got a vehicle that say understeers, what would you do? What does that indicate? Um, and what would you do to try and counter that? So understeering indicates that you've got a loss of grip at the front end because you've got like, more slip angle at the front end. You know, what changes could you make to tow or camber to give you better grip at the front? So obviously you know, one of the things with camber is if you've got more uh, sort of negative camber or um, you know, in the, as the vehicle's going around the corner, you want the tyres to point towards the centre of the corner, um, which gives you a bit of camber thrust, so just from lateral force. And so giving it more negative camber might be a solution. Also, in terms of toe angle, um, depends on when you've got toe out or toe in, it will give you different properties um, in terms of how the vehicle turns into the corner. Sort of stuff. But there's obviously downsides of those things, you know, on along the straight being um, not, not optimised. So there's like sort of things you could do. Um, so yeah, make sure you understand the effects of changes in each parameters and what you might do in certain scenarios. Yeah, okay, so that's the sort of thing you need to bear in mind. Um, and then in chapter five, we focus very much on sort of looking at both centre and double wishbone types and different um, yeah, parallel equal length converging, um, unequal length and that sort of stuff, short long arm, um, and why different systems exist. The predominant reason why you've got these different setups is due to camber recovery. So as the vehicle goes around the corner, it will roll out of the corner. And obviously if you've got no camber recovery, the wheels will also roll out of the corner. Um, but that's, that gives you adverse camber of the wheels. And so um, the short long arm will allow the vehicle to roll, say, by four degrees. But if you've got 50% camber recovery, the, the wheels will only roll by two degrees. And then if you've, got, if you've got some static camber set up in the suspension system and the uh, four degree body roll, the wheels only roll out by two degrees, you've still got negative camber or positive or, or, or you know, non-adverse camber um, uh, within the you know, vehicle set up. So obviously that's ideal. Um, <coughs> then there's some discussion in the, in the notes around how to determine the roll centre for a bunch of different suspension setups, including double wishbone. Okay, to find the roll centre, and obviously the roll centre will have quite a big impact on roll because the distance between the roll centre and the centre of gravity is that, is that big moment that, um, that, uh, you know, that, that joins up the two. You want to avoid a high roll centre because that leads to a bunch of, uh, a couple of big um, issues, um, jacking and a lateral scrub, okay, and those are things that are undesirable with the suspension set up. Um, uh, and, uh, but then, obviously, a low roll centre will increase that roll moment, so you've got a bigger roll um, moment being generated, and that needs to be resisted by uh, the springs okay, on each side. Sorry, uh, just a question just came into my mind That's from it. your previous um, <coughs> explanation. So, you know, like, when they fix the alignments of car, mm -hmm. like negative camber and positive camber, like, so 
when the, when the car is like uh, up above, like on the hoist, yeah, and they 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 change the like uh, it's like make it zero degree camber, like it's oh like, yeah, well they they won't they won't measure it when it's, when the wheels are in the air. Yeah, can, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant because if it's when it's on the air, if, it, if they make it zero, like when they put yeah, it like yeah, on yeah, the yeah, ground, course, yeah. it's going to go yeah. negative. Isn't that's right, yeah. It? Yeah. yeah. No, what no, what they'll do is they'll measure it while the car's sitting on the ground, okay, and then they'll obviously. If they need to make adjustment, that's when they raise it up and make an adjustment. And then put it back down and then measure it again. Okay, so they, they don't measure get it like, um, in the air. You know what a four poster ramp is? Uh -huh. yeah. So you've got a bed, four poster, it's called advanced alignment, and then they put like sensors on each wheel, yeah. mm -hmm. put a steering wheel straight, and it all links up to a computer, and then it would put in, you can tell you the tolerance is out in it, yeah. and you got to manually adjust the parts to bring the camera in or out or tow in. Yeah. Until it comes into tolerance, yeah. and that's how you set up. The tolerances are preset by, mm -hmm. the, manufacturers. by the manufacturers. Well. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so they measure it. So when they when it goes up, it doesn't matter. Like it goes minus or so. Oh, no, no, because no, it, it's not being no, measured with no, the airways. Still, the, the, the vehicle sits still, on the ground, on the ground, the or, or sits on the bed. So yeah. the car drove onto this bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The bed would raise up. And oh, down. okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know, I know. But then to adjust okay. it, they'll need not, to get not, on. The, not the ones like the pivot hoist. It's like the bed hoist, the one you're talking yeah, yeah. about. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah you can do it with everyone. Because usually, what you notice if you lift up cars with the other ones. The camera will actually go in like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because all yeah, the weights course, come yeah. off, yeah. and then when you bring it back down, it stays like that. Yeah. So you drive so it. That's what I was saying. Like if you if it's up and you well, make it zero, that's what happens with jacking. <laughs> so that would happen if you yeah, if came you, off if, the floor. Yeah. So basically, as as the vehicle bounces or whatever, um, you end up with the camera changing so much that does that when the vehicle comes back down, you end up with this. Yeah. Yeah, and then it needs to drive before it sets up. And obviously, if you're in the middle of the corner and you get this jacket, you've got the massive advanced camera causing the vehicle to fall. Yeah. No, but if you don't have a bed, I think there's another way, like you can do. In my mind, I'm thinking maybe like, okay, just measure it when it's down. Yeah. So when it's going up, doesn't matter like how much angle it's like changing. No, no, just no. change the angle that yeah, needed yeah. to be changed. Yeah, that's right. Then then yeah. put it down and it's gonna be like yeah. straight. Yeah. No. Do you know what I meant? You couldn't, like, no, you couldn't do it that way. No, you can. You can see, like, so this is you. You have a negative camera, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so you, like, you measure how much negative you have, like two degree. So when you take it up, it doesn't matter. Like, you have zero. You have to adjust it to like two, two degrees. degrees. Yes. Yeah. So when it goes down, it will fix. It. Okay. So I guess that's why in vans and four by fours, you notice the jacket more. <laughs> well, like I said, you can have a have a four by four set up with a low roll center, but like I said, the thing with the roll center is is it you know that distance between the center of gravity and the roll center height is the thing that gives you that roll moment. And so, in a four by four with a high, you've got a high center of gravity. You probably want the roll center to be a bit higher. But yeah, um, yeah. Whether you get jacking, like I said, jacking is generally undesirable. So you don't really want you don't really want it. Um, um, and like I said, if you've got a roll centre coincident with the centre of gravity, not only is the roll centre likely to be very high, but you actually get no roll moment, so you get this very strange feeling car. And if it's higher than the centre of gravity, then the vehicle would like roll the wrong way, which would be, which would be, um, it's not, it does, that doesn't help in terms of the, uh, the the balance of forces on each side, because it's essentially the car is going to roll out of the corner, it's not not lean into the corner. Yeah. Okay. So although the direction of roll will be the same. You know, if you've got, imagine a pendulum, um, the pendulum is moving out of the vehicle, okay, so the high roll centre. Whereas obviously what you want is a, a, a the, the body to roll into the corner, and that's so like a motorcycle. You know the king, kingpin inclination, uh, does that like comes from the roll centre? or no, the that's, centre of that's, that's independent of the roll centre. Okay. The king pin inclination is the, uh, is the, ang is the, is the um, angle of the steering axis when looking at the vehicle from the front or the back, yeah, yeah, but that, uh, but obviously, that um, that is independent of where the roll centre is. That's it's just uh, okay. Yeah, you know I mean, well, it depends on the suspension setup. Uh, if you've got a strut, uh, a strut based suspension system, the, the uh, that angle or that that unit um, would dictate where the roll centre will be. But obviously, um, but you don't have to a double wishbone suspension wouldn't have the same thing or a super strut even. Yeah, so it's different, yeah, from, from that. Yeah. 
um, that sort of, you know, like I said, the, that's more about, you know, the kingpin and the caster and the cam, uh, the caster and the kingpin at the front, um, you know, will change how the, when the, ve- when the wheels steer, it will change how the, ca- that, that adjusts the kinematics of camping and sort of stuff. And, uh, and caster um, is about steering feel, and, you know, it gives you the trail and the self-centering forces. Yeah, so as you widen and lock and then accelerate, the wheel will unwind itself. If you've got a large cast triangle, that force to unwind itself will be bigger than if you've got a very small cast triangle. And so there's all those different, different sort of aspects. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and so the, all that stuff leads on to actually working out, okay, well, look, how do we calculate more angle? And so in the steady state, there's a very straightforward equation um, that you can derive, derived in the notes on working out what the roll angle is. And, you know, the roll angle, you've got these two things that are causing the vehicle to roll, so that's due to the lateral acceleration being applied at the centre of gravity causing the vehicle to, you know, the roll out of the corner. Um, that's added to by the fact that the weight transfer, or the, the, the weight of the vehicle, um, the centre of gravity will move out of line with the centre of the vehicle, causing the additional roll, OK? So there's these two things that are causing it to roll. And they need to be opposed by the springs pushing in the opposite direction. And so you end up with this equation here. So you've got the, obviously mv squared upon r is your natural acceleration. Okay, that distance between the centre of gravity and um, the the roll axis is this um, value a, and that's AFD um, plus ALC over L. Okay, so that's there and also there. Okay, and W is mg. That's the weight of the vehicle. And then obviously these are the spring forces. And so that's your roll stiffness just there. And then obviously you've got these equations. So, you know, combine them all, to, all together in, in a specific way. You can find out what theta is, which is your roll angle. And obviously you can then work out what's, uh, you know, what the roll angle will be in a certain situation where you're travelling at a certain speed, going around a certain radius, and you end up with a, with a, with a roll angle. That equation will produce a value in radians. And obviously if you want to look at it in degrees, and then make that conversion. Um, Clearly, it's proportional to the lateral acceleration, mv squared upon r. If that goes up, your roll will increase. Okay, and it's inversely proportional to the roll stiffness, which is in there, and also the track, you know, the track width, which is your t-term. So the wider the vehicle, the less roll you're going to get, and the stiffer the springs, the less roll you're going to get. Okay. Um, notice that this a term is also a bit in term here, but that's a minus sign, and so obviously, that if that goes up, the denominator will um, will reduce, uh, which will increase the roll. Okay, um, and obviously to work this out, you need to work out what A, F, A, R, C, and D, K, F, and K, R, R, and then apply the equation, you get the wall angle. And obviously these are the wheel rates. And so if you're given the spring stiffness and the lever ratio, you need to convert them to wheel rates to get to put in that equation. So that's assuming the spring is right at the wheel. And obviously, as we know, that's not really the reality. That's not necessarily the case. So those are wheel rates, and obviously the stiffness of the springs would be. Um, You've got that lead ratio at a bit in there as well. <coughs> okay. And then, um, yeah, so lastly, um, vision strategy. Okay, so exercise at the end of the chapter is obviously something to go through. Um, have a go at some previous exams. So on Blackboard, in the vehicle dynamics section, there's a bunch of questions from past papers just around vehicle dynamics, okay? And then also, um, if you come out of the vehicle dynamics section in the main learning materials content area, there's a revision folder, and in there, there's the complete most book for exams for 2018, 2019, and 2021, okay? Um, and if you've got any questions, email me or to do with engines, uh, Faisan.